there's a slight chance that uh, in the middle things will crash because I have so many movies built into this. It's like a 80 megabyte PowerPoint presentation. So if that happens, we just get things started again. Okay. So uh, um, yeah. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, life in the micro world, and I called it a mathematician visits the biology department. Okay. Yeah, a disaster. Well, actually, uh, um, I, I work here, but I also work over at DRI, but I'm actually not allowed in any of the labs. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, they said a mathematician can't, can't go in any labs. So, Actually, I just haven't taken the, uh, the safety course, you know, yet to take safety courses. We work with lasers, so yet to take some, I don't know. So I'm actually not, I could go in, but somebody has to hold my hand. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So here's my collaborators, and I actually, uh, I, uh, I uh, just before the talk, I put the fields that these guys are in. Okay. So these are the guys who I've done, done this research with. Uh, uh, George Oster, who's actually a nuclear engineer from UC Berkeley. Okay. He has a PhD in nuclear engineering from Columbia. Right. He got that in the '60s and decided he just hated nuclear engineering. And he met a biologist when he was a postdoc out at Berkeley. And it just went from there. And he's become one of the, the most famous uh, uh, biophysicists in the world. He's a member of National Academy of Science, one of the bigwigs. Uh, Howard Berg, absolute bigwig. He's a, he's a physicist and uh, probably the, uh, the number one expert in this field. Uh, Aravi Samuel was his, uh, was his student. And he's a, he's a true biophysicist. Uh, Richard Montgomery, uh, he's the guy in the t-shirt standing up back there in that picture of, uh, of a uh, sailboat in Rio de Janeiro, okay, and he was my PhD advisor, okay, and uh, he might come here and give a talk sometime, okay, he's, uh, he's an expert in celestial mechanics, something we were talking about in Calc 3 today. Uh, uh, Jerusa was one of our, one of my, one of my students in, uh, when I was in Brazil. Uh, she got a PhD in math under uh, Jair Coiler and I. And uh, Alexandra is actually a philosopher, and he's the, uh, he's the director of the, uh, the planetarium in Rio de Janeiro right now. He's worked with us for a lot of years. Bianca uh, Brashama is a uh, biologist from Scripps Institute. And uh, John Heuser is a, uh, he's actually an MD. And uh, he's our expert on electron microscopy. Okay, and I'll show you some of his images a little later. Okay? But uh, quite a collection of mathematicians, physicists, biology, and we all, uh, we all work on the same problems. Okay? And philosophers. I don't know. Okay? So, uh, 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 so where did this field start? Well, I would say this is a good place. With this, uh, with this nice lecture by, uh, by Richard Feynman, he, he gave this really influential talk called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom where he introduced the field of nanotechnology. Okay? Um, and uh, I would claim, though, that, uh, that bacteria were the, uh, were the first nanotechnologists. Okay? And I'll explain why later. Okay? So questions that I'll ask are these. What's life like for an organism that swims in, in water, a microorganism? How do they move? How do they sense their environment? And how do they control their motions to move to more favorable regions? Okay? So those are the basic questions that I study. Okay? Well, Ed Purcell, who uh, actually won a Nobel Prize in Physics for developing magnetic resonance imaging, so MRIs, gay, uh, addressed these questions in an influ influential and classic paper about uh, 40 years ago called Life at Low Reynolds Number. He was a professor at Caltech. Okay. And he said, I want to take you into the world of very low Reynolds number. That's where microorganisms live. A world inhabited by the overwhelming majority of the organisms in this room. This world is quite different from the one we've uh, developed our intuitions in. Okay. Uh, this is Howard Berg, my, uh, my colleague from Harvard. And, uh, and uh, he says, today is a model of Zara. We're entering a new phase in the study of chemotaxis, right? How do you set, how do microorganisms sense their, sense their environments and make decisions on how to move, okay? That's what chemotaxis is. Um, 
in which enough is known about the detailed properties of signaling network that its behavior can treat, be treated analytically and simulated numerically. So now physicists and mathematicians have entered this world of biology in a very, uh, in a very important way. Okay? Okay. Now, this is sort of an out of, uh, out of uh, step uh, slide, but I left it in here. Um, lately, I would say in the last two years, I've been getting flooded with review requests for papers, right? Part of, part of a job of a researcher is to do peer review of other people's work. And lately I've been getting flood, just floods of, uh, of papers by people designing nanorobots to perform medical tasks. For instance, uh, uh, a common theme is that what people want to do is take very tiny robots and inject them into people as a way to uh, deliver drugs into very specific sites and cells. So what you would do is you would, in, you would in, in inject a swarm of these micro robots into a localized area, right? And then from there, they would move on their own. They'd sense their environment and move into the exact positions where you want them before they release their, uh, their drugs, okay? okay? I think it's still science fiction, and I don't let many of these through, but they're being developed, okay? Well, things move fast, okay? Well, swimming microorganisms live in an unfamiliar world. We live on land and are about 75,000 grams. E. coli swims in water and has a mass of about, well, whatever that is, grams. Therefore, we are that many times more massive than an E. coli, and that has profound effects on their lives. So in the shoes of a bacterium, what would our, what would our environment be like? What would, what would life be like if we were a bacterium? Well, first, if we try to move, water sticks to us. The drag is overwhelming. It's like swimming in tar. Okay? So to, a, to an E. coli, it's like swimming in tar. But on the other hand, we can't stop jiggling. Thermal energy keeps us moving in a constant, riotous, random motion. This is called Brownian motion. Water to us looks like a fine grained substance. It looks like little softballs just constantly beating us and knocking us off course and jiggling us here and there, right? So if we try to move, the flu is just like tar, but we're just being jiggled all over the place, okay? So it's just, it's a really tough environment to live in, okay? This is one consequence. If I know I want to go this way and I swim with a boat with a propeller on it, I can't just aim that way and start going. What'll happen is Brownian motion will just knock me off course. In about two seconds, I'll be, I'll be going in a completely different direction. See? So just normal steering mechanisms that we'd use to control our motions just don't work for bacteria. Okay? Now, how do we eat? Well, to collect nu uh, nutrients, we have to wait for molecules to diffuse through the fluid and happen to run into a chemoreceptor area on our outer membrane. Okay? You can't just swim up to a, a piece of food and eat it. The water is so sticky, if you try to swim up to it, it just gets pushed away. So you actually have to wait for molecules to find their way and accidentally bump into a chemoreceptor. And that's how we would eat. Okay. Why swim? Well, bac bacteria swim to improve their situation. Some swim to escape chemicals in their environment. For instance, uh, sulfur-reducing bacteria want to get away from oxygen. So they want to swim down. They want to swim down in the mud. Okay? Uh, uh, others are attracted to certain chemicals. E. coli are attracted to sugars and proteins. Um, there's some very, in, uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, they have, there's this big lagoon. And there's some very interesting bacteria there that have little magnets in them. And they use these magnets as compasses. And these bacteria always swim north. They follow the, the, the magnetic flux lines on Earth. They always swim north while the magnetic flux lines go north and down. So if they follow these magnetic flux lines, it takes them down into the mud. These are sulfur-reducing bacteria. It's very interesting. You take these bacteria up to uh, North America, and in about 24 hours, enough mutations build up 
that they all swim south. <laughs> but they're fun to play with. You put these bacteria under, on a, under a microscope, and you just get a magnet, and you could actually steer them around, and they'll just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can mess with them. Okay. So self-propulsion of a bacterium for, uh, through fluid, okay? And this is a direct quote from an E. coli cell. It told it to Purcell, right, the guy, the, the, the guy from Caltech. And this bacteria said, well, what is this thing you call inertia? Bacteria have no concept of, the, of, the, of, of what inertia is. Okay? okay? So, Reynolds number. For fluid motions, the Reynolds number is based on size, speed, and viscosity of the fluid. And what it measures is the rev relative effects of inertia, i.e., the ability of a swimmer to coast. Okay? So if you're a human swimmer, right, and you jump off the side of a pool, you glide a great distance across the pool, don't you? Right? And if you're really good, you could glide about halfway across, take one or two, one or two strokes, and you're on the other side. What causes, what causes you to keep moving forward through that fluid? Well, that's inertia. It's because you have inertia. The more inertia you have, the further you're going to glide. Okay? Uh, this is actually a picture of the ship I was on when I was in the Navy. And for a ship, they have a lot of inertia. If, they're going to, if a ship is going about 20 miles an hour and they stop their engines, it takes about a mile. They coast for about a mile before they come to a stop. Aircraft carrier, three, four miles from 20 miles an hour. It takes them three or four miles before they come to a stop. A lot of inertia there. Okay? What about an E. coli? Okay? How far do they glide? Well, when this, uh, when this Reynolds number is very, very small, then viscosity dominates over inertia. Okay? So the Reynolds number for an E. coli is about 10 to the negative 4. And Purcell made this calculation right here. If, a, if an E. coli is swimming at 10 body lengths per second and then throws in the clutch and stops its, stops its motors, how far does it, how far does it glide? Okay? Easy to figure out. You use Newton's second law. And those who haven't had calculus, okay, well, you could look and be amused by it. But if, you'd add, if, you, if you've had calculus, you'll recognize this. What I did is I wrote down Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. Okay? So mass times the derivative of velocity. Okay? And then I set that equal to the force. And what this is is the force on a sphere moving through a fluid. Okay? It's just 6 pi times the viscosity times the radius of the sphere times the velocity that you're moving out. Okay? That's how much, that's how much uh, force it takes to push a sphere through a fluid right there. Okay? And then I solve this. Okay? Let's see what the solution is. Bop, 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 bop. And I come up with the result that if a bacterium is going at 10 body lengths per second and it stops swimming, it glides for a distance of about 0 0.04 angstroms. 0 0.04 angstroms. What's an angstrom? How big is an angstrom? It's about as small as it gets, isn't it? Okay. Conclusion, from full speed, 10 body lengths per second, the E. coli will coast a distance one-tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. Okay. An E. coli, no force, right? As soon as they stop swimming, what do they do? Dead stop. Zero inertia whatsoever. Ah, ah. So what do you need to keep an E. coli moving? You need to keep pushing, don't you? Is that the way our physics works, the macroscopic physics works? Actually, we were talking about that today in class, weren't we? Right? What do forces do in the macroscopic wor world? They change velocity, don't they? If no forces act, what, does velocity, what, what happens to a particle? It just keeps moving with the same velocity, doesn't it? When you, when you apply a force to it, it changes the velocity. Okay? But for an E. coli, what do you have to do? For an E. coli, you have to keep pushing it. In other words, in other words E. coli understands what kind of physics? The physics of the ancient Greeks, who thought 
that to keep something in motion, you had to keep pushing it. That was Aristotelian physics. Okay? You've seen the, you've seen the, uh, the paintings of the moon being pushed across the sky by angels, right? Okay? They thought you needed an angel to push on the moon to keep it moving across the sky. Now we know that the moon moves across by itself. You don't need to push, do you? If you push, what happens? It just changes the trajectory, right? And in fact, for the moon to keep it in orbit, where do the angels have to be? They have to be on top, don't they? Why? Because the Earth's round. And if no, if no forces act, what does the particle do? What does the moon do? It just flies off in a straight line, doesn't it? So what do you do? You put the angels on the back of the moon that do what? Keep pushing it down into its circular orbit. Okay? But for E. coli, where do you have to put the angel? Behind it. And the angels had to push it along, don't they? Okay? And of course, the question is, what are the angels in the case of E. coli? In the case of keeping the, er the moon in orbit, what are the angels? It's called gravity, isn't it? It's called gravity. Okay? But what are the angels for an E. coli? Okay. Well, is, this, uh, is, the, uh, is, uh, is uh, swimming at low Reynolds number relevant to humans? Well, sometimes. Here's an example. Boston, Massachusetts, 1919. A five-story vat split, releasing two million gallons of syrup onto the streets of Boston. A wave of the sticky syrup, 25 feet high, destroyed buildings and killed 21 people. Rescuers had to wade through this stuff. They were living in the world of an E. coli, weren't they? No inertia, very viscous, trying to wade through this syrup. Okay? And uh, the story goes that one firefighter became exhausted and drowned in this stuff. Okay? Well, look, taking account for the difference in scale Swimming bacteria must overcome viscous forces more than a million times greater than those suffered by the Boston rescuers. For an E. coli, things are a million times stickier. Okay? How do they move? How do they wade through that muck? Okay? Okay. Well, these are the equations of motion. Okay? These might not mean anything to anybody, but right here, this is, actually, this is actually Newton's second law applied to a fluid. Okay? P is the pressure, and this is called gradient. So what does that make you think? Pressure gradient means that the pressure over here is different than the pressure over here. And what's that going to do to your fluid? It's going to make it move, isn't it, because of the pressure differences. Okay? So there's a force due to pressure gradients. Okay? Right here, this is your viscous forces. And over here, this is your acceleration, okay, times your density, which is mass per unit volume, okay? Well, according to E. coli, right, according to E. coli, mass times acceleration is actually equal to zero. For E. coli, instead of solving F equals ma, they want to solve what? F is equal to zero. F is equal to zero. So if you have a free swimming bacterium, when they move, they, 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 if they move their body a little bit, they actually rotate and, and translate through the fluid a little bit in a way that cancels all net forces and torques exerted on the fluid. Okay? Macroscopic organisms don't do that. When they swim, right, you accelerate parcels of fluid. Okay? When an E. coli moves, it doesn't accelerate parcels of fluid. When they move, the fluid moves. There's no little vortices shedding off of E. coli, in other words. Okay, there's no accelerating fluid. Okay, well, what does this mean? This means, if I'm right, that fluid motions in this regime should be reversible. In other words, if you take a fluid and stir it, and you do it the exact opposite, you should be able to unstir the fluid. Doesn't seem right, does it? Put some dye in a fluid and stir it up. What happens? Can you unstir it and get that, and get that dye back out? No. But in the low Reynolds number regime, you actually can. Okay? Here's a demonstration given by, uh, 
by a guy named uh, uh, G.I. Taylor, a famous uh, fluid dynamicist at, uh, at Cambridge University. Okay? And what he's going to do is he's going to put some dye in glycerin, which is a very viscous fluid. And he's, he has a little mechanism that he could stir it carefully one way and then reverse it exactly. And just watch what happens. No tricks. This is this was made in 1950. No, no video tricks here. <laughs> he gets it pretty well stirred up here too. So at Low Reynolds number, you could stir and you could unstir fluids. Could you have the same thing with water? No. Well, well, yeah, but you'd have to take a very, very tiny parcel of water and move very, very slowly. Then you could do it. Okay? E. coli, e. coli work in this domain. Okay? So this gives us something called the scallop theorem. Okay? This guy Ludwig uh, Wilhelm in 1930 was the first to realize that reversibility has an important consequence at low Reynolds number swimming. Simple reciprocal swimming strokes lead to no net motion through the water. They call it the scallop theorem because if you have a very, very tiny scallop, right, then the fluid mechanics is reversible and scallops do what to swim? They just open up and then they close. And then they open up and close, but if everything's completely reversible, where do they go? Nowhere. They just, they just oscillate back and forth, right? At high Reynolds number, you could accelerate parcels of water. And what do they do? And then they move forward by jet propulsion, taking an advantage of inertia, don't they? Right? So macroscopic organisms swim by different means than small organisms. The fluid mechanics is completely different. For very small things, everything's reversible. Okay? So a microscopic scallop gets nowhere. So they must adapt swimming strategies to, that do not rely on inertia for progress. Okay? Now, my recommendation to you, if you're in a Boston in a, in a big vat of syrup breaks, okay? Don't try to get out of that syrup using a flutter kick. Just boop, boop. Right? That, reciprocal, that simple reciprocal motion will do what for you? You'll just do this. So what do you do? You do some sort of a, do some sort of a breast stroke, some sort of a non-reciprocal motion. Don't do anything that's just back and forth. That just, you just oscillate, right? Do something like this and swim through that syrup. You'll be OK. OK? Well, I just put this slide here to, uh, to skip. I wrote this for, uh, for the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, science organization of retired people. And I made this slide just to scare them a little bit. You know, a little bit of real math there, you know? Uh, but uh, to a normal human, that's what swimming looks like, right? When I think of swimming, this is the picture that comes in my mind. <laughs> See? This plane right here, which is actually an infinite dimensional space, is your space of controls, and up here is your infinity plus three-dimensional state space. You want a picture of that? <laughs> and and when, I, when I do the uh, analysis of swimming, I actually start with this picture right here. Okay? And that's just for fun to look at. Okay? Well, E. coli, the best, uh, the best understood bacterium. E. coli typically live in the guts of warm-blooded animals. Most are harmless. Some cause problems, and those are the ones that get the pre get the pre get depressed. That get the press. Uh, e. coli can live outside in dirt or water, or on lettuce, and while waiting for a new uh, while waiting for a new host. And in water, they swim using something called flagella. Okay, so an E. coli is basically a shell that contains various uh, various molecules: DNA, RNA, uh, proteins, small molecules. And they actually have these little 
rigid helical structures come off that they use to propel themselves through the fluid. Okay? And they have, uh, they have on average about four of these. Okay? And, uh, and then E. coli is about two times 10 to the negative four centime uh, centimeters, or about two microns. Okay? And uh, uh, I like Howard's uh, uh, description of, e of an E. coli. It's a self-replicating object, only a micrometer in size, can swim 35 diameters a second, right, through the, through the syrup, right? Uh, taste simple chemicals in an, its environment and decide whether life is getting better or worse. Okay? So here's a, here's a, uh, a movie of swimming E. coli taken by uh, Howard. Kind of interesting the way they swim. Do you, uh, let me see if I could get this to run again. Maybe, maybe not. Doesn't matter. It comes up later. That's all right. That's all right. It'll come up again in a minute. In a minute. We'll look more closely at what's going on there. Um, so, in spite of the overwhelming drag, E. coli are remarkably fast. So, here's Michael Phelps, 2004, Olympic gold medal. In the 100 meter butterfly, time 51.25 seconds, which converts to one body length per second. E. coli can actually swim at greater than 10 body lengths per second. So I give the gold medal to E. coli. <laughs> yeah. It should be an Olympic team, right? Phelps is a little better looking than the E. coli, though. I, I, yeah. Okay. E. coli swim by rotating a rigid helical flagella, right? Those of you who've had microbiology probably know this, and, and you saw it, and you're like, oh, okay, big deal. You know, that's it's another thing I'm supposed to learn for the test or whatever. But it's actually quite remarkable, okay? In the 70s, nobody would have believed this. Nobody would have believed this. E. coli actually have propellers, don't they? They have propellers. Can you think of anywhere else in biology where you have things propelled by propellers? Propellers. E. coli actually have little electric motors that spin a propeller. The propeller is in the shape of a helix, but it's a propeller, just like a boat. There's little electrical rotary motors attached to the outer membrane of the, uh, of the, the cell. Okay? And these motors propel, spin a propeller. Okay? I, think that's, uh, I think that's quite remarkable. And look how fast it can go. 300 hertz. What is that? 300, 300 rotations every second. Okay? So if you, uh, if you unload one of these motors, right? And Howard did this. Right? He, broke the he broke the propeller off and let the thing spin. And he was able to learn that it that it spins in that circumstance at 300 revolutions per second. These are remarkably fast motors. Isn't that a sound wave? What's that? 300 yeah, hertz? yeah, yeah. That's, that's within the, uh, the, the auditory uh, realm. Hey, great. OK. In the 1960s, Feynman offered, Richard Feynman, offered a $1,000 uh, prize to anyone who could build a working motor less than 1 64th of an inch on a side, and his challenge was met. Here they are looking at this motor underneath, a, uh, underneath a, a microscope. E. coli's flagellar motor is more like 1 640 thousandths of an inch on a side. In terms of volume, that's a million, million times smaller than this motor right here. Question, how is it discovered that, that the, uh, the flagella spin rather than wag? Right? If you look at a larger cell, like a sperm cell, how do they propel themselves? They have a flagella, right? I don't know if I have a... Maybe this, maybe this right? right? But they basically look like this. But what does their flagella do? It wags. It wags. Okay? 
right? If, if you take a cross section of it, there's little cables inside of there, right? And it pulls and tugs on these little cables and causes waves to pass down the tail. And the thing wags like this, okay? And when you look at an E. coli under, uh, under the microscope, it looks like exactly the same thing is going on, okay? A problem is the diameter of the propeller is less, the, the diameter is less than the wavelength of light. So you can't really see what's going on under a light microscope. We could see better now because we use fluorescent light, right? We, gr we grow uh, mutant bacteria that fluoresce. Now we could uh, see things a little bit more clearly but it's pro their, their flagellum is probably still less than even uh, ultraviolet in diameter. So you actually can't see what's going on. You could see something, but that's just diffracted light. Okay? So under a microscope, you can't really tell what's going on. So how did they determine that the difference between wagging and rotating? Well, they did this. They grew some, uh, some mutant bacteria whose flagella bind to a certain protein. And they took a glass slide and coated that glass slide with this, uh, with this antibody, with this protein. Put a little drop of water containing E. coli there and let them swim around. And every once in a while, they'll swim too close to the side and their flagellum will touch the slide and bind. Then what do you got? You got an E. coli by the tail. Where's the little? There it is. And that's what you got. <laughs> yeah, so. Nice, huh? Do you notice something, though? Watch one of these guys. They go one way, then they stop, and then they go the other way, don't they? So they spin one way, then they go and go the other way. Okay? And they actually do that in response to chemical gradients. Okay? We can actually control the spinning by passing chemical gradients across the, uh, these bacteria. Okay? And that's how we learned how they control their motions. We get them attached to a slide, then we pass chemical gradients over them, and watch how they go this way, then that way, then this way, then that way. And depending on what we pass over them, they change the, the reverses, the times of reverses. Whoops. Oh, get to see him again. Okay? Okay. Well, there's one problem down. We know how they propel themselves, right? But how do they control their motions? Okay? Well, the problem is Brownian motion. Okay? And this is just a little, little illustration of what Brownian motion can do to a particle. Think of these as being your cell, and think of these as being the water molecules, right? They're bouncing into this, uh, the water molecules are bouncing into the, this little cell and causing it to jiggle all over the place in this sort of random motion. Well, in this, uh, in this environment, how would you get to where you want to go? You want to go to where there are more nutrients, right, if you're an E. coli, or you want to get away from oxygen if you're ox oxygen phobic or, or whatever. Okay? So uh, this is called Brownian motion. And it's, uh, it was discovered by uh, Robert Brown, who was a botanist, who was actually, uh, uh, he was actually looking under a microscope at, at leaves. And he saw this little jiggling motion. Okay? And that's just motion due to heat, due to thermal energy. Okay? Okay? So because of Brownian motion, an E. coli can't just simply uh, swim straight towards an attractant. Brownian motion knocks it off course by an average of 30 degrees in one second. It's, off no it's knocked off course by more than 90 degrees in 10 seconds and completely forgets where it was going. Okay? So what does it do? Okay? Well, here's what it does. So getting the greener pastures, a biased random walk. So E. coli measures the rate of chemoreceptor occupancy as it swims, right? So it collects data about its life. Okay? Is life getting better or is life getting worse as I'm, as I'm swimming? It collects that data and makes a decision. Okay? Now, when the motors spin counterclockwise, the, helical, the, uh, the, the, uh, the flagella form together in sort of a helical bundle and spin together and make a propeller. And the, and the cell swims more or less straight, but being knocked off, off course by Brownian motion, of course. 
But when the, uh, when the motors spin the other way, what happens is that bundle comes apart and the cell actually tumbles randomly in the fluid. Okay? So what a cell normally does, right, there's no chemical gradient. Right? If, the, if, the, if er, uh, the amount of food is the same everywhere, what it does is it swims for a while, then it reverses engines, and it tumbles, and then swims in a new direction, then tumbles, and it just does this periodically. And it just goes around and searches the fluid. But if it determines that it's going up a chemical gradient that's favorable, Okay? So if it determines that it's heading towards food, what it'll do is it'll just slightly delay the tumble. See? So E. coli, no probability theory. Okay? What do they do? On average, they still go through this sort of random walk through the fluid, but on average, they find their way up the favorable direction, right? By just slightly delaying their tumble, their random reorientation, if they're going in a fa favorable direction. Why don't they just keep going that way, though? Brownian motion knocks them off course. So it doesn't make any sense to keep going. See? So they do what's called a, a, a directed or a biased random walk up the chemical gradient. And if you look at these E. coli, you could actually see it happen. Do you see them go? And then, and then uh, every once in a while, See, they're running, and then, and then they change direction really quickly. Did you see that guy? He was coming across, and then he, and then he went into the slide. Yeah. Okay? Here's a variation, spirochetes. These wonderful guys. Spirochetes responsible for Lyme disease, syphilis, and other wonderful things. Uh, they swim in, in, uh, in uh, fluids where external flagella might not be effective. Things like mucus, right? These, these long helical propellers don't work very well in mucus. And what some bacteria have evolved is internal, internal uh, 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 flagella. So the flagella is actually under the cell membrane. And when it spins, it causes the cell to sort of corkscrew and drill its way through the fluid. Here's some, uh, here's some, uh, some spirochetes. I think these are Lyme disease here. But those are spirochetes swimming through a fluid there. See how they kind of just drill their way through. They, they still had the, the, the flagellar motor, and they're located at the tips of the cell. And then the, the flagella wraps around the cell body, and when it spins, it causes sort of a drilling motion. These things drill their way through the fluid. Well, these are what I study. It's called Cynococcus. So these are uh, modal strains of the cyanobacterium Cynococcus. And these were discovered in the Atlantic Ocean in the mid-1980s. Okay? They're rod-shaped bacteria about 2 micrometers in length and speed at, swim at speeds at about 25 micrometers per second. So they're really fast. But what's remarkable about these is they have no flagella at all. They're just little rod-shaped bacteria and they go, but there's absolutely no moving structures on them that we could see, and they just go. And it's been a mystery since they were discovered how these things propel themselves through fluid, okay? And you might say, okay, well, these are just unimportant little bacteria that live out in the middle of the uh, Atlantic Ocean, but it's actually not the case. Uh, uh, Cynicococcus is a photosynthetic bacteria that lives in well-lit euphotic zones of lakes and oceans. By mass, it's the most common organism on Earth. Okay, so it's not just some obscure thing. Yeah? What is a euphotic zone? Well lit, a, a, a biologist. Well lit. Well lit, yeah. So it's a well lit, well lit zone? It's a well lit, well lit zone, yeah. <laughs> Um, um, so how were these discovered? So people thought these uh, sort of ocean deserts, these regions out in the middle of the ocean, had no life in them, basically. But water samples revealed, uh, uh, revealed uh, chlorophyll at levels that they just didn't expect. 
And then they put the water samples underneath a microscope, and they were just teeming with these things. And uh, yeah, it's kind of remarkable that they were just discovered in the 80s. Okay? Um, about the, uh, a third of the strains that live in the open ocean can swim. Okay? Uh, while photosynthetic, uh, modal strains of Synecococcus do not show a phototactic uh, or photophobic response. In other words, they're not drawn to light or scared of light. Okay? But they do show a chemotactic response to certain nitrogenous compounds. Okay? Uh, motility is thought to allow open ocean synecococcus to take advantage of microenvironments. Uh, basically, I'm saying we really don't know why they swim. We have some ideas, but we don't know why they swim. Okay? E. coli, we know. Certain organisms, we do. These, we don't know a lot about. Okay? A lot of mysteries here. Okay? Well, synecococcus is thought to move by passing transverse or longitudinal ways along the outer surface of the cell. Transverse waves are waves that you, that you imagine, right? Like water waves. Longitudinal waves are like sound waves. The motion is back and forth, okay? What we think might happen is that the cell is actually moving, but we can't see it, but it's moving longitudinally. That's one idea. The other idea is that the transverse waves are actually so small that they're below the resolution limit of a microscope, so we can't see them. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Okay? Now, transverse, wa uh, 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 transverse waves are waves that pass down the cell body. And if the, uh, the wave passes this way, pretty obviously the cell, the cell is going to swim this way. Why? Well, because the cell is pushing water back. And when you push water back, you go this way. Pretty obvious, right? What if it were, what if it were longitudinal waves, though? Okay? If you have compression waves, it turns out things are very counterintuitive there. If the waves pass down the cell body this way, guess which way the cell goes? You'd think if the, cell, if the waves go this way, the body goes this way, right? It'd go the opposite way. But it turns out with longitudinal waves, the cell actually swims in the same direction that the waves are going. I know, I know. You have to work out the fluid mechanics and figure that out. Can you see the, uh, the longitudinal waves there? I'm kind of standing too close to it. Yeah, you can see. See the line up there? And the waves are passing this, this way down the, uh, the line, aren't they? Okay. The waves pass down the, 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 the line this way, and the swimming direction is exactly the same direction. And if you look at that, you might think that I'm cheating and that these dots are actually, are actually moving along from this end to this end. But they actually aren't. They're actually, the dots are actually just jiggling back and forth. But they're jiggling back and forth, and they're syncopated in a way that you get compression waves that move down the cell body. Okay? Um, and that's what these are. This is the same animation as this. This is just with a few, a few dots plotted instead of a bunch. Okay? And of course, you could have a, a combination of both types of waves together. Then each of your uh, points on the cell membrane would move in a little elliptical path. Okay? For, for transverse waves, they just move up and down, right? For longitudinal, just back and forth. But you could have a combination. Then points on your cell membrane would follow little ellipses. Okay? Question. How are the waves formed? What's the mechanism? And this is what I've been working on lately. Well, a clue came from another bacterium called M. xanthus. Okay? This, is a, this is a bacterium that lives in the soil and is able to glide over, glide over surfaces using two different mechanisms. One's called amotility, and that, uh, that applies to individual cells crawling, and something called esmotility, which is a, a clump of cells that moves in concert, that moves together. Okay. Uh, here's a uh, here's a little movie of uh, M. Xanthus crawling along a glass slide. Okay, and they sort of glide along. Okay, and we recently figured out how these things move. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Here's the life cycle of these. These M. Xanthus start as, start their life maybe here as a fruiting body. Okay, so this little stock thing. And what they do is they, they emit spores that become individual cells. These individual cells 
crawl using this adventurous motility. And, and they gather together in little clumps. And when they get into the clump, they extend these little rods and attach, attach themselves to neighboring cells. And these, and these rods, they could draw in and put out. So you have this clump of cells attached together with these movable rods. And these clumps of cells can change the shape of the clump. And they crawl. And they hunt bacteria in these things called wolf packs. OK? And they, and yeah. And so they, they crawl along in these things, in these, uh, you know, in these, uh, in these uh, mounds and these wolf packs and hunt for bacteria. And then, uh, and then what happens is if, uh, if uh, they run out of nutrients or water, they revert back into this stage again as a fruiting body. They could actually live that way indefinitely okay? until they, they, de they detect that there's sufficient nutrients and water again. Then the whole life process starts again. But uh, this is actually kind of, inter this is kind of interesting in itself, I think. Right? You have these individual bacteria that act collectively as a single organism almost. Okay? And then pff, spread out, crawl together, form this pack, hunt, form this fruit, and they have this, this very incredible uh, life cycle. Okay? Well, how do they move? Well, the idea for many years was that they have snot guns. Snot guns. They had these little holes on the back. And what they thought was happening was they were secreting mucus through these holes and kind of moving by jet propulsion. So they were, well, the way George puts it is they were blowing snot out of their rear ends, right? And doing that, they were propelling themselves forward. It turns out that turned out to be wrong, though. It was a wonderful idea, and it, it was lovely to talk about, but it turned out to be wrong. What actually happens and this is something very remarkable. This was just discovered uh, uh, a couple years ago. Okay? And this is by our, uh, our group. That inside of, these, uh, inside of these bacteria, there's actually a cytoskeleton. And there's little protein motors on the cytoskeleton that drive its rotation. So inside of the cell, there's, there's this little double helical skeleton that spins and it's driven, by, it's driven by motors, OK? And what happens, whoops, dup, 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 dup. what happens is this. That helical skeleton spins, and they do emit the slime. That was right. And they, they make this sort of slime trail. And these protein motors kind of whiz along this, uh, this cytoskeleton. And when they get on the side with the slime, they get kind of caught in these traffic jams. And the traffic jams cause lumps of these protein motors. And, in the, and you could actually watch these little protein lumps travel down the cell body. And as they travel down, it pushes, almost like a snail, it pushes the, uh, pushes the cell along the slime trail. Okay. And that's, that's, that, that turned out to be what's going on here. And we're, at, we're able to actually watch these proteins by attaching uh, other proteins to them that fluoresce. Then we put the, the cell under a black light. You could actually watch these proteins moving along this, uh, this, this skeleton, right? And watch the whole thing happen. Okay? And we made movies and whatnot. Okay? Well, Sinococcus has exactly the same motor parts as M. xanthus. Okay, they have the, uh, the, the cytoskeletal filaments and the mode AB homologs. These are the, these are the parts of the, uh, the flagellar motor inside of them. Okay? So all of the parts that are in M. xanthus can actually be found in Simicococcus. Okay? The problem is M. xanthus just goes, just goes a few body lengths in minutes, whereas Simicococcus goes many body lengths in a second. Things are much, much faster. M. xanthus crawls, Sinecococcus swims. So how can you take the same parts and build something that would propel you through a fluid? Okay, how do, how do you adapt the model, in other words? Okay, well, we think we may have figured this out. 
we think we may have figured this out. Here's actually a picture of the, uh, the outer membrane of, of Sinecococcus. Look at that. What do you call a structure like that where, where you have molecules that are periodically arranged? It's a crystal. Yeah, the outer membrane on a Sinecococcus is actually a crystal made up of proteins. And then uh, we took a, we, we sliced a, a Sinecococcus sideways, and you could actually see these crystals here, okay? And they're aligned at a, at a 60 degree angle with respect to uh, uh, the normal, straight out, okay? This is a, uh, 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 these are electromicrographs taken by our friend John Heuser, the, uh, the MD, okay? Cells lacking this S, S layer are non-modal but still spin on their axis if, you, if they get attached to a slide. So what do we think happens? What we think, what we think happens is this. Those protein motors go around this cytoskeleton just like they do in, S, in uh, M. xanthus. But what they do is they rub up against, they essentially rub up against this uh, crystalline layer. And it's a double helix, and the question was, Shouldn't everything cancel out, right? One of the helices is spinning around and moving down this way. You know, if you watch it, it moves down this way. But if you look at the other helix that's attached in the reverse orientation, it would push things down this way and it cancels everything out. But the clue was those proteins that are arranged at a 60 degree angle. And so what happens is those things get pushed and they rock, rock up on end and, call, and cause transverse waves as the, uh, as the helix moves down. So that's how the waves are formed, okay? And what's kind of cool is this, right? So if the protein moves this way, it causes these transverse waves, right? To, uh, uh, it causes these transverse waves to push the fluid, and, the, and if the fluid gets pushed this way, the cell goes which way? The opposite way. But the other thing that happens is as, as these, these uh, proteins get pushed by the helix moving the other way, what it does is it causes a separation in the tips, which, is what, which causes what kind of wave? The longitudinal wave. But it's going in the opposite direction. But that's good, isn't it? Why? Because transverse waves and longitudinal waves cause propulsion in opposite directions, don't they? So you have the transverse waves going this way, the longitudinal waves going this way. Both of them push the cell which way? That way. Nature is pretty amazing, isn't it? Takes advantage of both types of waves. Okay. This is a picture. This was just uh, this work was actually just featured in uh, uh, um, Scientific American. It was, uh, it was over the summer. So these are, these, are, these are my pictures. I made these. Scientific American made those. I think their pictures are a lot better than mine. <laughs> a real graphic artist. <laughs> okay? Okay. Well, you have these proteins causing these lumps to travel down. Well, why, how do you get a, uh, how do you, uh, uh, that wouldn't account for the speed of these things. So what, what we actually think happens is, when these lumps travel down this crystalline uh, 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 layer here, there's coupling between adjacent uh, proteins. And, and rather than just getting lumps that travel down the cell, you get sort of ridges. Because in the, in a, in the one direction, the, uh, the proteins are, uh, are coupled to each other. Okay? And, uh, and we get something like this. So those proteins travel down and cause ridges in the one direction because of coupling between the adjacent proteins. Okay? And you get these ridges traveling down. Okay? And let's see. Here's a, here's a just a, to wrap up, here's some words of wisdom for theoreticians. Okay? This is from uh, George Oster. He's the, my main collaborator on this these days. He says this, physics tells you what can happen, and it tells, you, it tells you what can't happen. It also tells you what could happen, but it doesn't tell you what can happen. For that, you need experiments. And being in a biology department has 
force me to stay close to the experiments, right? We come up with theory as physicists, right? But the verdict always comes out of the biology department, the experimentalists, okay? Um, so the next question is, how can we test this? And my answer is, come to my next talk, and I'll, and I'll have one for you, okay? Um, about uh, two weeks ago, I actually got a, uh, a clue, maybe. Somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna help me with this. A, uh, a postdoc at MIT wrote me an email and asked if I could get some cells for him because his lab has developed some new software that's able to amplify motions. The problem is, is we can't see these waves because they're too small, okay? And what they've developed is this motion amplification software that does a very, very good job at the amplification without distortion. And I'll run this movie right here. And what this is a picture of, this is an eye. This is a video of an eye. And this is exactly the same eye, but run through their software that actually amplifies motions. Normally, if you, do, if you just try to blow things up, what happens? You get all sorts of distortion. You can't see what's going on. Okay? This is a, this is a, 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 a very sophisticated uh, uh, software that actually amplifies motions in a way that you don't get distortions. And so what we're going to try to do is take these cells, you have to hold them cell, still. So we're going to have to hold them still, maybe with uh, optical tweezers, hold them in a single position, and see if we could apply, take vi high speed video of these cells and apply the software to them and visualize the, uh, the waves. Okay? And just for fun, I just sat in with Mathematica, I made a little, uh, movie of what I hope to see. These are the same. These are exactly the same uh, movies. This is run through the, soft, the online version of the software, which isn't very good. So there's a lot of distortion. But this is what I'm hoping we'll, we'll be able to see with our Seneca caucus. Okay? Ah, well there. Muito obrigado. Gracias. Merci. Spasibo. Danke. Grazie. And I can't pronounce the last one. But I used to live at the place where they speak that language. That's Aleut. I used to live in the Aleutian Islands. But I don't speak Aleut. <laughs> there you go. <laughs>